So how's everybody doing? It's day 225 of 365 days towards racial change. My name is Tomlins Nyback. Let's get right into it and uh, see how blacks are going, doing, being in America. Uh, that's why we're here. That's why this particular project was started. You know, we're answering questions about Oh, the power and control dynamic among, between black and white folks. We've got a lot of little communities in between and whatnot, but that's primarily the message. Um, we are going through, we're getting back into some sobering topics, back to facts and historical uh, precedents on why some of these issues persist in America. Uncle Tom's Cabin is a great illustration, and we get a lot of great talking points from that fictional work, uh, but we can't get too far away uh, from the fact that there's plenty of historical and factual information out there uh, that we can refer to to give us a lot of information on um, what we're dealing with, what, how we feel here in America, you know, our, the black experience. That's the only one I'm a, a real authority on here. Concerned about the black mind? Uh, are any black people grasping care about what this what this is about? Is there even an audience? You know, very few. You know, we're, we're moving so fast now. We're not taking the time anymore to critique, reason, explore, dissect what we are uh, dealing with in America here. Um, and we really need to come to terms with that, do that more, but no one ever listens to me anyway. <laughs> so I'm sure it's a very select minority of black people that are taking the time uh, to process to any degree. Uh, as for the white mind, I'm, I'm concerned, like, uh, I'm wondering, I'm in a phase wondering about the level of denial among white folks. I tell you, I do have white friends that do recognize their position. They recognize that they are fortunate to have been born on a certain side uh, of the equation in America. That comes out in Harriet Beecher Stowe's work as well. The, the, those, especially Marie St. Clair's wife and St. Clair, I think he mentions it too, about being, uh, feeling, you know, a sense of relief that they were born white and not sleeping on the, in, on the mud, the dirt, on the floors as a, as a regular plantation field slave. Do white people understand what, what's going on in the white mind? Financial literacy is important. I just finished a book um, by a Mr. Griffin called um, the Creature from Jekyll Island. I immediately jumped back into it to get up front uh, and look at it again, like a good movie. You know, you look at a good movie and something you go back and, and go back and every time you look at it, there's another little detail that's gonna give you some reason for what happened later on in the movie. So I went back, I mean, the book is close to 600 pages and he really, takes us on a journey, my hair is like standing on that on end on some of his proposals in there. So uh, that's going to be a little journey, spending time again uh, with that material. But uh, uh, financial literacy uh, is a focal point of that, and I, I want blacks to understand how money works, where it goes, who's benefiting, from it, um, you know, now that I can, now that I've gone through that book, 
and some other material, Robert Kiyosaki as well. Uh, well when I see um, references to interest rates from the Fed and oh the, the, the stock market and its condition, uh, I know when I'm looking at my bank account, where's money going, how it's being spent. You know, I've got a better understanding of how it works, what's going on there. So uh, that's all good stuff <clears throat> uh, to know and understand. And you want to get your mind around that uh, so you can be financially literate, be prepared, have more control over where your dollars go in America. I am heavily influenced by a man named Dr. Claude Anderson. We are in a, uh, going to be in his work for a couple days. Black History Reader, 101 Questions You Never Thought to Ask. And <clears throat> uh, we're looking at um, the introduction of that book just to get a starting point, get the conversation going. For me, again, I've been on vacation. Um, uh, so I'm not, I'm a little rusty and stuff, so I got it's going to be a little while to get my groove back. <laughs> Black Labor, White Wealth, Search for Power and Economic Justice, and also by Dr. Claude Anderson, Poweronomics, Dr. Anderson's National Plan to Empower Black America. You can find Dr. Anderson at poweronomics.com. Behind me, you see your hashtag, us too simple, by Black women uh, supporting one another, associating, having their conversation. Check out Black Enough, B L A G G E N U F, for kind of a black Facebook experience. If you can't find your flavor here on the World Wide Web, do what I did, start your own little channel. And finally, we will get back to story time, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Um, just going to lay off on that for a little bit, let that simmer. Um, <laughs> The year is starting to get away from us, and I'm going to have to start making some decisions. I won't be continuing this after 365 days. Uh, I'm going to be in school, and i got to put a lot of energy into that, and I'll probably recycle a lot of this material as time goes on. All right, we're still going through Dr. Anderson's introduction uh, here yesterday, uh, we talked about some broad issues, uh, the centuries of slavery as an institution, uh, Jim Crow, benign neglect, being politically, politically correct with terms like inclusion, diversity, people of color, immigrants, things like that, and how that turned into this big kind of melting pot to forge all these uh, groups uh, with issues together with black people and that's that's turned out to be detrimental to black people it's, it dilutes um, the focus away from black interests and, and black concerns and those groups are and those names are more acceptable therefore they get attention uh, but they're not black groups, right? That's going to be a, a conversation, an argument that we're going to have to get back to because the immigrants think they have the same uh, problem as black people. LGBTQ thinks they have the same problem as black people in America. Uh, those in being inclusive and diversified think they have the same problem as black people in America. People of color think they have the same problem as black people in America. But the, pro the problem for black people in America is unique, singular, and very exclusive. <laughs> you know, we, we, as a group over centuries, we've been terrorized, marginalized, uh, what well, we've been, uh, had uh, economic warfare waged against us specifically and uh we'll get we'll get into that that's going to be a constant refrain but today we're going to talk about some of the constitutional basis 
for this. You know, we're going to extract our moral feelings. Um, I, I've shared my story, but that's not the... Um, my story is not going to educate you. Yeah, plenty of black folks have stories, you know, about being at a disadvantage in America. Nothing's new about that. But but do we understand where the con where the Constitution of the United States comes in? You know, you know, what's your Constitution? You know, uh, can you eat nuts? You know, some people are allergic to nuts. Well, that you're allergic to nuts because your constitution of your your, your body's system rests on, on you know the, a certain balance of chemicals, nutrients, and such. And there's an ingredient in nuts that uh, give you an allergic reaction. You see, you know, that's their constitution. Well. America has a, a similar similar systems in place. Oh yeah, later on we've got amendments and things like that to I don't know, make America feel good, like, almost like a, a topical curative salve over uh, the issues. But the underlying constitution of America is such. That it's, all, it's always going to produce a certain result. It's not going to get a, you're not going to get too far away from this because uh, these institutions that we rail against here at racial change are in place uh, to an end to extract those, which is what I propose. Let's extract it, but you can't extract it because if you extract some of this stuff. You want to kill off the nation that rests upon it. Uh, let's go through this. So I don't want to abstract too much uh, away from this. We're still in Dr. Anderson's introduction. He gives three purposes for his book, A Black History Reader. First uh, purpose is to illustrate, talk about the constitutional basis for his argument. Right, he's not talking about feeling bad about being whipped, beaten, kidnapped, raped, all that. We're just talking strictly factual evidence uh, that's easy to find on the internet and such um, for this, for why America is the way it is. You know, um, you know these white institutions, white power took advantage of some circumstances early on, but, uh, you know, they, they wrote it down and lived by it. And when they wrote it down, they created this fixed uh, chasm between whites and blacks in America, and we can't, we're not getting too far away from that at all. Um, so we'll talk factually about, and this is just some research I did on, on the internet. These are from uh, documents, easily easy to find uh, on the internet. I have no doubt about their validity. You want to look for James Madison's notes, easy to find. James Madison's notes on the Constitution, and look look up the Constitution uh, of the United States. You want to get the Constitution and uh, 13 or 14 amendments. I'm not an expert, but it's enough to have this conversation, trust me. Um, so this fixed relationship is constitutionally based, and we're not gonna get too far away from that. First, we know we looked up James Madison notes, and if you go through his notes, you know, he's, he's going, he's at the, uh, 1787 Philadelphia's convention uh, to get the Constitution together. His notes, he's got 107 days 
worth of notes in there from uh, May. You have some initial meetings he's written on. Then he really gets going uh, June, July, and August. And it peters out at the beginning of September. It's about 107 days worth of notes. Now in his notes, you, see, you know, he's jotting down conversations that are happening on the floor uh, between the delegates, representatives, and stuff. And you see over and over again, if you uh, search it, if you know how to search a doc, electronic document, um, control F for PC users, <laughs> uh, search slave, black, Negro, and you'll find the references in his notes uh, on that. Some particular days to take note of is August 25th and uh, September 15th. Both of those days were, were pretty uh, heavy, but and more importantly, those days reference August 22nd actually was a big day. He took a lot of notes about slaves. Uh, and let me just back up. His notes talk a lot about the slave trade. And Georgia and South Carolina seem to be the focus, a lot of the states, about uh export and import taxes around slavery and whether the slaves could be voting and there's arguments, well, if the slaves are free, why don't they vote? If, if they are um, farm implements like farm animals, why do we want to include them as three-fifths in the um, in assessing representation of states. So that's a whole nother conversation, but you'll, if you read the notes, you'll see a lot of that. Uh, but uh, August 25th and uh, September 15th, important because they talk about, it, it, it's references to how to exclude exact references, specific reference you know, about, you know, concerned about being explicit about having language referring to slaves in the final draft. You know, they didn't want to use the word servitude because it might make a person re reflect upon reading on slavery and that the, you know, the slaves are represented in here in some special way. And they, did, they didn't want to use uh, the word slaves specifically in the final document. And this this is important because I know it's educational for me because you know because uh, they use they use they massage the text uh, to be more friendly to the common reader you know but they did it with intention of hiding. Um, the true intent, you know, they didn't, uh, they didn't uh, help us, help the slave, help the black American in any way. You got the 13th Amendment where they get off of, uh, they, they say, okay, they're a kind, they're working on abolishing slavery uh, and whatnot. And, and, and I think at the end of the 14th Amendment, they talk about slavery, but that's in reference to paying debts, and things like that. I don't know, but those are amendments. Again, that, that's the salve <laughs> that, that, that's over, you know, because you you're, remember back to the uh, illustration with nuts, you know, if you're having a reaction to nuts, you know, you can go to the hospital and get treatments and things like that to mask or cure the reaction. But the con your constitution, if you are um, allergic to nuts, has not changed. You still have a relationship with nuts that uh, will not change. Well, that's the same way the Constitution of the United States. You know, these guys have a 108 days, uh, a bulk of those days, I won't say the bulk of those days, 
the days that they talked about slavery and, tra and was later translated into the Constitution are very focused days. Yeah, maybe not every day. I couldn't find slave, Negro, uh, black in, in James Madison's notes for every day that they deliberated on creating this document. Uh, but the days that Madison uh, writes about um, this conversation on the floor, they're, they're very potent days, very focused. You know, uh, so it's not even about quantity about of the attention towards black slaves, but it, it's the potency in there. That they weren't leaving Philadelphia without making sure <laughs> that the slaves stayed slaves, impotent, um, illiterate, and all this stuff, and that they, the white establishment, remained on top of that equation. You know, um, they had a lot of things to work on and discuss, uh, but they they had to deal with that issue. You got to read both documents. But you, you, you'll pick it up quick. Read James Madison's notes and then look at the Constitution and see how they massage the text to be in the favor of the white establishment, white power. Uh, Dr. Anderson, he calls the Constitution America's first affirmative action plan and kept white people focused and empowered and uh, you know make sure that that institution is not going to be touched in all of its um, its existence in America kept that in place so the affirmative action was to support white folks and it kept black people at a disadvantage. Uh, created a system where 100% of the wealth of the nation would be essentially housed uh, within the context of white society. Slaves and their descendants into perpetuity would be the recipients of privation, struggle, disadvantage. You know, it takes takes me uh, at least almost twice as long to get to a space where I can experience um, you know, some movement, some growth in this system where um, white folks do pretty well in the system because created by whites, for whites, and it's administered by whites. Uh, so who's going to benefit from that? In my brief notes, I talk about when uh, I took this little piece of an aloe plant, right, tore it off, you know, somebody gave it to me or whatever, and I went deep in the woods and got uh, some dark soil, a lot of decay in there, a lot of organic material and I planted that little piece of aloe in there. <laughs> the thing grew to grotesque proportions because the soil was the right soil for that. Uh, anyone struggling in America is going to be uh, is because the soil uh, it, it doesn't support um, uh, their kind of advantage. It's the same same way. And that's what's happening with the colors in America, the color of skin. Um, also, he talks about here this constitutional base uh, reason for this fixed relationship. Uh, it's supported by the Supreme Court. Uh, we'll see, we find that, you know, up to 
uh, and before the uh, Dred Scott, before the Dred Scott decision, you have, uh, oh, John Quincy Adam with the uh, Amistad solutions um, where John Quincy Adams kind of got those guys free. Well, Dred Scott, Dred Scott, um, the Supreme Court later, after John Quincy Adams, supported Dred Scott and says, you know, we have a uh, that black man shall have no rights or privileges that a um, black man, white man, black man will have no rights that a white man should uphold. Uh, lower courts support the Supreme Court, of course. Uh, you got education as a barrier, as a place to uh, condition black folks. You've got uh, levels of conservatism, stereotypes going on. Um, you've got your homegrown terrorism in the form of the Ku Klux Klan, White Citizens Council, and the White uh, Freedom, America's Freedom Party. You, know, you have all those institutions involved and securely in place, uh, nourishing themselves in the white soil of America, and uh, that's those are some of the you know that's the outcropping of the institution, the constitution-based uh, reasons for the fixed relationship uh, between blacks and whites in America that you're going to find that's going to be a problem in this country, you know. So that, you know, there's facts, black and white. You know, we haven't talked anything about hurt feelings or moral depravity, religious, spiritual arguments. We might get to some of those later. Uh, but you need to know, you need to understand that this country is built on these. Uh, issues and concerns in America and there's no way you know we have to kind of be okay with that you know we can't expect America to function naturally in any different way without a whole lot of effort you know because of its constitution these are the rules that uh, decide and declare how America works, what America means, how it functions for it to uh, be other than what it is. You have to apply all kinds of, uh, you know, amendments and new laws and stuff, uh, but the foundation is uh, extreme prejudice, racism, marginalization, uh, enforced, disadvantaged towards and against a whole other people uh, in this country. And it's sad too, you know, there is some language you'll find some of the men as quoted in James Madison's notes as saying that the black people do need some compensation at some point in time for their labor and stuff like that. That, that is um, the admission of some of the speakers. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, slave owners and stuff quickly beat them down on that point. But, you know, you, have, you do have some of the people represented at that convention in uh, 1787 that say, hey, you know, what do we gotta give these black folks something for uh, putting them out there like that? 
it's sad that they they dragged their knuckles and are lethargic on doing what's right. But that that's that's where we're at. That's you know why is there racism, extreme hatred, and all this? It, it, it's because of the very nature of the country rests on those racist elements. It's written down. Um, it's, it's implied. It is what makes uh, America what it is. I'm Tom Lins Nyback. Day 225 out of the way. Constitutional, uh, constitutional, the Constitution based reasons for America's racism. Let's find out what Dr. Anderson's got to say to us tomorrow. Come back and join us now. Bye bye.